Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? Welcome to the first episode of The Black Outbreak, the third book in the Black series. If you're new around here, you might want to start with the first book, The Black. However, since the first three books are what I call paraquels, as in parallel off-timeline stories, you're safe to start here. For those of you M2 veterans, welcome back. If you want to support the podcast, you can purchase any of my ebooks from Amazon.com and my audiobooks from Audible, my site, and various other retailers. Or you can become a subscriber at Patreon.com slash Paul E. Cooley or BuyMeACoffee.com slash Paul E. Cooley for exclusive content. That said, let's get into it. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode one of The Black Outbreak. Fireside Audio presents. The Black Outbreak Written by Paul E. Cooley Performed by Joe Hempel Chapter 1 She hated driving in the rain. Dr. Jennifer Harrell turned on Cambridge off of South Main, her car splashing up water that hit the windshield in a wave. The pouring rain made visibility bad enough, but driving through the water pooling in the low spots made it worse. As if that wasn't bad enough, she was on the phone with the boss. We have alerted Homeland and they'll make a determination of how much help we get. Great, Jennifer said. Any idea what that's going to look like? All depends, the gravelly voice said. I'll be on a plane in the next three hours headed to join you. God damn it, Jennifer thought. Just what we need. When was the last time you were in a hot spot? Understood, she said instead. Boss? We need to make sure we don't have any military underfoot. Unless they know what they're doing, it'd be best if they stayed the hell away from the scene. Agreed. Something scratched and then thunked at the other end of the line. Jennifer winced at the pop through her car's speakers. Sorry, drop the phone. Jennifer rolled her eyes. No problem, sir. Except for my ruptured eardrums. Barely visible signs for the Houston Zoo and Kip Aquarium showed up in her headlights. Jennifer didn't even notice. She was focused on what had to be done when she arrived. What's the ETA on the ambulance? She asked. Fifteen minutes. We rerouted them after the alert. Why didn't we dispatch the ambulance to the quarantine center at the airport? Too far away. My understanding, the boss said, is she'll be dead long before they get there. Jennifer nodded. I take it the folks at Ben Tob know what's coming? They should already have the quarantine preparation underway. You'll have to check in with their ER supervisor and make sure they have what they need. They better. They've had the protocols and the supplies for well over six months. The boss sighed. Right, but you know how it goes. Indeed I do, sir. How it goes, she thought, is that they either didn't pay attention during training, didn't come up to speed on the new equipment, or just plain forgot how to do it. Great. Is there anything else you need, Jennifer? She thought for a moment before turning on her blinker. It was difficult concentrating on his voice, the road, and the billions of thoughts cartwheeling through her mind. Yeah, I need the communications up pronto. We dispatched Hoyt's team to Howe, and they should be there in another 20 to 25 minutes. I want to make sure we're not going to have any snafus here. Agreed, the gravelly voice cleared its throat. She could see him now, sitting up in his bed or at a desk in his Maryland house, jotting down notes and still brushing the crusties out of his eyes. She knew how he felt. If you think of anything that the Houston office doesn't have, you contact me immediately. Understood, boss. Be careful with this one, Jennifer. This isn't Liberia. If we have an outbreak, there's three or four million people that could drop dead in a day. Yeah, please remind me again she thought. Will do, boss. Good luck. I expect a situation report in an hour. You'll have it. One final grunt of agreement uttered over the speakers and the phone call ended. Jennifer sighed, turned on to Tob Loop and stared at the sprawling hospital. Through the sheets of rain, she followed the signs to the emergency care area. They were going to get lucky. The ER slash trauma center parking lot was practically empty so long as the ambulances hadn't been delivering gunshot and car wreck victims all night, the ER staff would only have to relocate a few dozen patients to other parts of the hospital. But if the trauma ward had surgeries underway, 
they were going to have to work around them. Jennifer parked her car near the back of the lot and stepped out into the rain. Droplets quickly pattered against her black t-shirt and jeans. Damn, she should have worn a coat or a sweater. Something. Just hadn't been time. When the call came in, she was in bed with her lover, just about to go to sleep. They'd already showered, toweled off, and were tangled in each other's arms beneath the sheets. With a groan, she'd rolled over and checked the phone. The message header told her everything she needed to know, and she'd kissed him one last time before jumping out of bed to get dressed. That had been a whole twenty minutes ago. Jennifer yawned and grabbed her backpack from the passenger seat. She hadn't dried her hair before heading to bed, and now she was glad she hadn't bothered. She closed the door, moved to the trunk as fast as she could, quickly opened it, and removed both her tackle box and her CDC jacket. She shuffled into the jacket, cursing as rain stained the inner lining. With it zipped up, she pulled the hood over her head, locked the car, and headed to the ER entrance. A stone facade hung over the ambulance and car loop leading into the ER. Jennifer smiled grimly as soon as she was within sight of the huge sliding glass door. A plastic yellow tunnel, wide and tall enough for a large man to walk through while carrying gear, jutted out onto the pavement from the left side of the doors. A gust of wind blew a sheet of rain across her, the tunnel crinkling and rattling against the pavement, its entrance wobbling in the wind. She made a mental note they needed to be careful not to rip the outer edge. The tunnel was there so they could take the patients directly from ambulances into the quarantine area without risking exposure to non-medical personnel. When the CDC truck arrived, and presumably her team, it was going to get awfully crowded in the parking lot rather quickly. She had to make sure things in the ER were set up as fast as they could be. Jennifer walked through the right side of the doors beside the tunnel and through another set of sliding glass doors. A tall, brown-skinned man, wearing a white lab coat over blue scrubs, stood near the entrance, close-cropped gray hair accentuating the silver frames of his glasses. Dr. Harrell? the man asked as she approached. Jennifer nodded. Dr. Sharma? He held out a hand, and she shook it. You're the only one here? Ah, uh, so far, the rest of the team is a few minutes out. So is our gear. She pointed past him to where the tunnel entered a large room across the hall. Is that our setup? He turned and followed her finger. Yes, yes it is. I'll give you the tour. Want me to take that? He gestured to her tackle box. No, thank you, I've got it. Although some coffee wouldn't go amiss. Of course, follow me. They headed further inside Ben Taub's ER and trauma area. Jennifer peered at the people sitting on the uncomfortable green chairs against the wall. Several of them had expressions of worry on their faces. Others looked dazed. What are you going to do with the other patients? Dr. Sharma didn't bother turning around or attempting to glance at her. We're moving them. We're getting a triage area ready upstairs in the main hospital, and then we're going to lock down the annex. Good, Jennifer said. How soon is that going to happen? A nurse appeared from an intersecting hallway and handed a clipboard to Sharma. He took it without breaking his long stride. Within the next twenty minutes or so. Have to make sure we have things set up and move our equipment over there. I need to check the tunnel, Jennifer said. Dr. Sharma nodded. I figured. The slight Indian man headed out the double doors to the tunnel entrance, Jennifer following a few steps behind. Aluminum ribs reinforced the composite rubber, neoprene, and plastic tunnel, protecting it against some physical abuse, but not that much. As they walked through the tunnel to the other end, she visually checked for tears or rips. The tunnel looked pristine. Dr. Sharma pushed through one set of chemically treated flaps and then another set at the room's threshold. Jennifer stopped just inside the room and stroked a nozzle for the portable chem shower hanging just outside the door. They have their shit together. She pushed through the final tunnel flap and into the room. Seven gleaming steel tables, each with its own mobile, heavy plastic curtain, furnished the room. Oxygen cylinders stood against the far wall. Masks, an entire crate of disposable gloves, blankets, and sheets piled up next to them. Dr. Harrell? Sharma had walked to the wall with the equipment and turned to her. Sorry, she said and pointed to the beds. Is this all you have? He bit his lip. For now. 
If we need more, we can move them up from the basement. We were told there would only be four possible infected patients coming? Correct. Jennifer walked to the wall, dropped her backpack and tackle box, and pushed them into a safe corner. I think this room is large enough. A grin slowly spread across his face, displaying ivory teeth. Good. We can't move you into the trauma center yet. Afraid we have two surgeries ongoing. She cursed under her breath. I was afraid of that. Jennifer pointed to the air vents in the ceiling. Can you seal those off? If this vector is airborne, we don't want to give it a chance to get through there and infect anyone else. We already shut it off, Dr. Harrell. She smiled at him, but knew it probably looked more like a grimace. The damned patients weren't here yet, and she already wanted for this to be over. I'll make sure and tell my boss Ben Taub was well prepared and ready for us. The man blushed. Now, she said, how about that coffee? Fortunately, the ER staff had a good coffee maker, and they brought Jennifer a steaming cup of strong coffee with two sugars and one creamer. Compared to the filth they had at her office, it was heaven. Jennifer managed to get four sips down her throat before her radio squawked. Mathis to Harold, come in, over. She pulled the small rectangular box from her belt and pressed the talk button. Harold, go. ETA five minutes. Will you be ready for us? Over. Ready and waiting? Over and out. Mathis out. She put the radio back on her belt and took another sip. Damn, but their coffee was good. Excuse me, doctor. She turned and faced Sharma, forehead slick with sweat, cheeks flushed. The man looked as though he'd run a marathon. Yes? Your team is almost here? Yeah. She turned and looked through the yellow tunnel and into the main hospital area beyond. She pointed down the hallway. You haven't closed that yet? We're working on it. As if on cue, a nurse hurriedly wheeled a patient into the hallway and Jennifer noticed a number of portable beds and examination tables now clogged the main hall. There's about five more emergency cases we need to send to the third floor, but we've already sent word that no more ambulances should come here. Also, we'll be posting a security guard outside with a list of alternatives for any walk-ins or drive-ins. Good, Jennifer said. The coffee drizzled down her throat and warmed her belly. With the hospital doors open and the rain coming down in sheets, the air had cooled considerably. Before long, the ER and trauma center would get damned cold. She held up a finger. Just to let you know, we're expecting some HPD officers in the next hour. They'll help take care of any crowd control. Sharma raised his eyes. Police? We have our own security. Just a precaution, doctor. How long before you evacuate the rest of the patients from this area? Ten minutes. Good. Jennifer started walking to the doors. I'm heading outside to meet my team. Okay, Sharma said from behind. When she strolled through the outer doors, the wind whipped moisture at her. The facade protected her from the torrents of rain, but her CDC jacket beaded with water. Going to have to dry everything off before we get set up. Another complication. That was all they needed. They were going to have precious little time to set up before the ambulance arrived. She'd have to get dressed in record time, and so would her staff. Sharma had said it would take them ten minutes to clear the ER. She'd hoped he'd given them some wiggle room. Ten minutes might be too long. Chapter 2 Calling it a van was disrespectful. Calling it a truck was, too. It was more like an RV cramped with supplies, portable testing units, and none of the comforts of home. Dr. Richard Mathis sat in the passenger seat drinking his second energy drink. The stuff sizzled on his tongue and down his throat where it turned his stomach into a cauldron of fizz. Heartburn was inevitable, but so what? He could catch something that could kill him. What was a little heartburn compared to that? Drills, drills, and more drills. And for what? For this moment. Ever since the Ebola epidemic in Africa, the dengue fever outbreak in Florida, not to mention the many, many rumors and doomsday warnings floating on the internet, the CDC and Homeland Security had been outfitted to handle multiple viral-slash-bacteriological scenarios. Cities like Houston, Chicago, L.A., and, of course, NYC, 
had a larger CDC presence than, say, Austin or Poughkeepsie. But if you weren't in Atlanta, you were a scrub. At least that was the attitude of those working in Atlanta. Mathis had worked there once upon a time and couldn't say he missed it either. Too many politics for his liking and not enough trips to the field. Since he'd joined the Houston CDC, he'd traveled to possible infection zones at the Mexican border in Del Rio, Laredo, and El Paso. And that didn't even begin to address all the times he'd been helicoptered to a ship on its way to the port of Houston, or walked up a gangplank to a freighter filled with six stowaways. But this? This was different. H-Town had its very own vector. The briefing had been sparse but exciting. Some chemist had accidentally cut herself on a barrel ship from Papua New Guinea. That in itself led to all sorts of exotic possibilities. By the sounds of it, it wasn't the dreaded Kuru. That was a prion disease made almost extinct due to the cannibals of old sliding off into history. Besides, Kuru didn't incubate this fast. No, what they had was something really cool. He couldn't wait to study it. Of course, the real pain in the ass would be if they got all dressed up for nothing. If this turned out just to be a case of necrotic fasciitis, a rather uninteresting and pedestrian vector, he was going to be pissed. He hoped against hope it was something new, or at least something he'd never seen before. That would make getting out of bed this early in the morning worth it. Jennifer Harrell, his boss, was already on the scene. That was fine with him. He liked loading up the mobile command center and making sure all the personnel were at base and accounted for. The team had standing procedures and orders for how to prepare for a potential hot zone. All Harold had to do was send out the notification, and everyone converged at base. Converge. He liked that word. When he first joined the CDC, he hoped for a situation like in the movie Outbreak, or like the books detailing the hemorrhagic fever epidemics in the 70s and 80s. Instead, it was mostly going over reports, looking for disease patterns, warning the local yokels, and dispelling rumor and panic. Boring shit. A pickup truck sped by them, ignoring their lights and siren, and flung a wave of water over the cab. Hurtado, the driver, muttered under his breath. I'm sorry, Matha said with a smile. What was that? Fucktard, Hurtado said. His eyes stayed on the road as he struggled to see through the falling rain. That's what I thought you said. Hurtado glanced down at the coffee sitting in the cup holder with longing before dragging his eyes back to the road. This is bullshit, Mathis. How do you mean? He asked and finished the energy drink. He filled the cab with a sonorous belch and crumpled the aluminum can. Hurtado shook his head. Getting us out of bed for another circle jerk. Oh, lighten up. This could be something interesting. Mathis cleared his throat and picked up the briefing clipboard. Low stats, plummeting body temperature, severe dermal necrosis. He put it back down on his lap and grinned. This sounds yummy. You are one sick fuck, you know that? Mathis saw the sign for Ben Taub. His stomach buzzed with excitement. Or maybe that was just the two energy drinks finally dissolving his stomach lining. There, he said, and pointed at the ER sign. Yeah, genius, Hurtado said. I see it. No need to get pissy. Pissy, Hurtado grunted. You're going to need to do that before you finish suiting up. And you're not? Hurtado swung the large vehicle into the ER parking lot, checked the facade's clearance, and pulled in. As soon as the vehicle stopped, Mathis grabbed the door handle. Through the droplets clinging to the window, he saw Harold standing just outside, a cup of coffee in her hands. Hurtado put the command center in park and turned the ignition to auto. If the batteries in the onboard generator started draining too fast, the vehicle would turn itself on to keep the juice going. Mathis hit him in the shoulder. Move it, he said. Hurtado groaned. One of these days, I'm going to kick your ass, Mathis. Laughing, Mathis opened the door and jumped down to the parking lot. His jumpsuit, only partially zipped, flapped in the wind. He shut the door and walked to Harrell. We ready? She blinked at him and then frowned. Mathis? Are you always so happy this time of the morning? Mathis shrugged. Why not? Finally get to do something interesting again. 
Your interesting is going to be here in a few minutes. Let's get into this. She tossed her coffee cup in the trash and walked to the back of the command center, Mathis following close behind. The sound of squealing metal echoed beneath the facade. The large vehicle's rear doors opened as he and Harold approached. Hurtado, half-dressed in a jumpsuit like Mathis, stared into the lighted racks of suits. He pulled one of them out and offered it to Jennifer. Here you go, boss. She rolled her eyes and took the suit from him. The command center was completely sheltered by the overhang, but only just. The wind gusted and droplets of rain spattered their clothes. Jennifer cursed. Helmet? Hurtado smacked his forehead and then pulled a helmet from the top of the rack. He checked the nameplate, nodded, and handed it to her. She took it and disappeared around the side of the truck. What about moi? Mathis asked. Hurtado wrinkled his nose. Get your own damn clothes. You know I outrank you, right? Mathis said. So the hell what? Get your own shit. Hurtado reached in and grabbed another suit and helmet. I ain't dressing your ass too, he said, and followed Jennifer. Shaking his head and chuckling, Mathis grabbed his suit and helmet. Through the roar of the wind and rain, he barely heard the sound of another engine. Mathis shut the doors and stared at the newcomer. The vehicle was covered in CDC decals. He smiled. Ah, the scrubs have arrived. The support van. It carried three more doctors along with backup equipment. Mathis waved and then walked around the command center. Jennifer, Sand's jumpsuit, had peeled off her water-laden CDC windbreaker and tossed it to the pavement where it twitched in the wind. She struggled into her hazmat suit and zipped it up. Hurtado was in the same shape, although he at least had a jumpsuit on. Jennifer was going to get mighty uncomfortable in those jeans. Maybe she'll get the chance to get naked later. Mathis felt a second of shame, but only a second. He zipped up his jumpsuit, expertly stepped into the hazmat suit, and fastened it. While he waited for the others, he held the helmet in his left hand, twirling it on two fingers. Fully dressed, sans helmet, Jennifer walked to the support van. The three personnel were already out and getting dressed. Hey, boss, Mathis yelled over the wind and rain. She turned around, eyebrows raised. You want Hurtado and me inside or outside? Get inside. Get things ready. Let me know if anything's missing. He gave her a thumbs up and pounded Hurtado on the back. Let's go, man. We got a hot one coming in. Hot one, Hurtado mused. I had a hot one at home. He's fucked all that up. Don't worry, Mathis said. I'm sure you'll be able to perform after a 24-hour stifling stretch in that suit and facing microorganisms that could kill you. Hurtado's Latino features paled. Gee, thanks for reminding me. Cackling, Mathis walked beside the quarantine tunnel and into the hospital. A tall, Indian-looking doctor stood by the door. Hi, we have a reservation for six, preferably in the candlelight room, Mathis said. Sorry? the doctor said. Ignore him, Hurtado said. He held out a gloved hand. I'm Dr. Hurtado, this is Dr. Mathis. We're here for the infectious disease duty. Where's the room? Mathis asked, knowing damned well the tunnel led straight into it. Uh, the doctor turned and pointed right where Mathis stared. In there? Great, Mathis said. And you are Dr. Sharma. Awesome. Let's see what you got.